I wrote this piece in response after I'd written this book called The Psychology of Sex, um, which um, I was looking at how psychology is sexy and sex over time, and I guess psychotherapy often as well. And it just really struck me with this book that actually a lot of the, what the psychology has taught us about sex it, it doesn't lend itself to consent at all. In fact, it kind of reproduces a lot of the conditions under which consent is actually really hard. Um, and then I also analysed a bunch of sex advice books. I read 60-odd um, sex okay. <laughs> I'm glad you feel my pain because it wasn't one of the most painful experiences of my whole life. It was oh awful. <laughs> um, and yeah, um, consent is barely considered. You know, even though we've got you know Me Too and people are aware now that consent is such a massive issue and that so many people are experiencing non-consensual sex, consent is barely considered in either psychology textbooks or in sexology textbooks or in sex advice. I found that less than yeah, it, was, it was around almost like average of 0% of the pages in sex advice books were devoted to consent. There's like nothing. Wow. There's just nothing in there. It's unreal. Um, and that, that book is the, the sort of hopefully antidote to this, which is a sex advice book I wrote with just Justin Hancock, who's a sex educator who works with young people. We actually have a podcast now. If you ever want to listen, it's quite fun. But we tried to make a sex advice book with consent at the heart of it, which um, was, so what's, was that. What's his name? Justin with Hancock. Justin Hancock. Yeah. With you, and yeah, the two of us work together quite a lot yeah. now. Um, but yeah, generally when consent was mentioned in the sex advice books, it was only in relation to marginalised sexualities like kink. So when they finally did talk about kink, right, right at the end of the sex advice book is this kind of weird thing that some people might do, but probably not most people. Then they'd say, oh, but you'd need a safe word and yeah, you'd need yeah. to be really careful. <coughs> it's like, what? there's no sense that you know regular sex might require similar degrees of carefulness around it. <laughs> Um, and arguably the opposite should be the case because consent at least is something that's talked a lot about in kink communities whereas you know until fairly recently it's hardly been talked at all in relation to hookups um, and even now you know the focus is often on like hookups and dating rather than long-term relationships in in which a, a number of non-consensual and unwanted um, sex things tend to happen mm. yeah so um, so yeah I'm kind of like thinking in a m number of areas like then what are the conditions that make consent difficult and how are those perpetuated by psychology, psychotherapy, sex advice, um, you know, mainstream media again. It's like the, the wider culture is shot mm -hmm. through with these non-consensual ideas uh, which make it really hard. You know, we're acting as if, oh, post me to, you know, all that needs to happen is people need to clue up a bit about consent and, you know, recognise that no means no or whatever and it's actually like the whole culture needs to shift. Mm -hmm. um, so like one of the things that was in a lot of the um, sex advice books was this idea that people have to have sex in order to be healthy. Like some of the sex advice books were like, it's as important as breathing or eating, you know, <laughs> that like to be a healthy individual, you must be sexual. And also to maintain a healthy relationship, it must be sexual. Often like very specifically certain amount of times. So it's really setting people up, you know, to have, uh, to feel forced and pressured into having sex. Um, and then linked to that the sense that what we mean by sex is a particular sexual script that must be followed and that if you don't manage to follow that then it's a failure and this really goes back to like Masters and Johnson right this kind of idea of the sexual script um, which is generally around kind of penetrative penis and vagina sex um, and still reflected in the dysfunctions in the DSM so if you look at those dysfunctions, there's disorders for penises that can't penetrate, for vaginas that can't be penetrated, and for anyone who struggles to orgasm from that kind of sex, even though we you know like actually loads and loads and loads of people struggle to orgasm from PIV, uh, penis and vagina sex. There's no disorders for hands that become tired quickly, or <laughs> <laughs> anuses that struggle to be penetrated, or people who struggle to have erotic fantasies. Um, yes, yeah, so it's clear like this is proper sex, and if you haven't mm. managed that, then you're a failure. Um, and so I think having that sense of that limited script that counts as successful sex and also scripts around, you know, what a good date is, you know, the good end of a date is that it ends in sex, right? Mm -hmm. it, anything else is a failure. It's not set up that the good end is that consent happened. That's what Justin and I are always trying to sort of shift, like, if we could have the, the sense that a good hookup is one that ends with consent, regardless mm -hmm. of whether sex happens or not, rather than, it, you know, having to be... You know, these scripts, I think, are, real, are really damaging because people are just trying to follow them to mm -hmm. the end and that anything else feels like rejection or feels like failure. And so 
the, yeah, the feeling that if people don't follow the script that they're failures. I think all of that mm. is definitely in there. Um, and so, and sets up a situation when it's really hard for people to, to negotiate consent. And I think asexual communities have been some of the most important ones in recent years to be challenging these myths because, you know, asexual folks come along and say, well, we don't feel sexual attraction and we're fine. And then, you know, uh, psychologists like Laurie Brotto have actually studied asexual communities and found, you know, yeah, this, it's borne out by the evidence around there's no higher rates of mental health problems or anything in those groups. And actually the DSM, you know, now have the footnote that says if someone's asexual, it doesn't, you know, they've not got a disorder, they've not got a dysfunction. But I don't know how that, I don't know if that's got across to many sex therapists. I think a sex therapist <laughs> meeting an asexual yeah. client is still going to think that's a problem that needs to be solved. And a lot of asexual people themselves are going to internalise those messages. Mm. Um, the, other, the other area of research is people in long-term relationships. Um, I did a book called The Secrets of Enduring Love, which was based on a study of long-term relationships and found that, you know, some, if you look at all the long-term relationships that people are pretty satisfied and happy in, some of them are having loads of sex, some of them are having none, a lot of them it's going up and down over time, you know, it's not linked to how good a relationship is, you know, it's, there isn't that correlation that, that the sex advice books like some of these ones are arguing is the case. And just their, their answers are so disappointing as well, it's like most of them the answer is just have sex in lots of different positions. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's got to be heteronormative it's got to be within yes. a monogamous relationship you've got to want to stay with that person for life it's like all this stuff constrains it and you know it mustn't be kinky or if it is you know maybe a little bit you should experiment a bit but not too much in fact I, you know i remember doing a talk on polyamory one time and a therapist in the audience you know said how successful are these relationships and i'm like what do you mean by success <laughs> and he's like Oh, you know, well, I mean, do they last over? I'm like, why is that our no, measure? No, no object constancy. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, another problem, normal sex. We have this, this strong idea of what normal and abnormal sex is, and people are so scared of straying into the abnormal. And, like, arguably this has got more complicated in recent years where there is this kind of idea that people should be experimental and be having lots of kind of exciting sex, and that, and yet they mustn't stray too far out of normal mm. sex, and that you know they're trying to walk this line all the time, uh, which is really difficult. And again, trying to do consent under those conditions when you're so fearful of straying outside of that line, but you do you know, but you're being encouraged. And again, you're not really being encouraged to tune in to what you want. Um, you're being encouraged to do a certain kind, whether it's sort of you know, very mainstream, you know, sort of heterosex in a bunch of positions or whether it is kind of swinging from the chandeliers, it's still not really from within you. It's much more like, you know, it's to, to perform that, right? Um, and as, yeah, so as someone rightly said, also this sense of like rigid ideas about the gendered roles in sex and the ways that bodies should perform those as well. Um, and, and it, you know, it, obviously the DSM-5 brought in this thing where they said, well, the paraphilias are only a disorder if you meet both the criteria on them, which is, you know, you have, you have the paraphilia and also you're distressed by it or it gets in the way of your occupational functioning or whatever its language is. But, you know, this is what they, the game they played with the homosexuality, right, back in the day where they took homosexuality mm -hmm. out, but they put in ego dystonic homosexuality, like it's a problem if you feel it's a problem. Mm -hmm. But the problem is if you're living in a really stigmatised society, then you're going to feel like it's a problem if you have any of these mm -hmm. desires. And also, these are the really common desires. You know, like, if you look at the sort of stats on how many people are turned on by some kind of power role play or some kind of bondage or intense sensations in sex or watching sex or being watched or playing with gender roles, like, that's most people. It's like mm -hmm. two-thirds in some cases of people have some fantasies of bondage, for example, or spankings, they're a really high one. So you're telling loads of people that their desires are abnormal or something worrying about them. Um, so even, you know, I think the DSM still needs to go further. And Charles Moser and Peggy Kleinplatz are really good to read on this. They both really question, they've made this argument that heterosexuality should be in the DSM because, you know, you can <laughs> totally like do the same kind of thing for that as you could for any of these other sexualities.